the 21st of December 1988, a brown Samsonite suitcase was loaded onto Pan Am Flight 103. Inside the case was a bomb. At 7.03 p.m. that night, it exploded over the Scottish town of Lockerbie. 259 passengers and crew and 11 local residents were killed. It is still the worst terrorist atrocity ever to have taken place on British soil. Although Libyan Abdelbasit El Magrahi was convicted of the crime in 2001 and sentenced to life in prison, his family continues to appeal the verdict. In this film, we remember the atrocity and recall the tragedy of that night through the personal stories of survivors and victims' families, some of whom have never spoken before. Who made the bomb that blew Pan Am Flight 103 out of the air and who placed it on board is still disputed 30 years later. What we do know is that the bomb was made of 450 grams of Semtex plastic explosive attached to a timer. The bomb was then placed inside a Toshiba radio cassette player. The cassette player was placed inside a brown suitcase. In West London, Kim Wickham is packing. She's one of a large group of American students from Syracuse University who have been studying in London for a term. She has never shared her story before. It was an awesome group of uh, people. We traveled to Paris, we traveled to Holland, we traveled to Italy, and then we also did the typical tourism things, you know, Madame Tussauds and uh, you know, things like that that normal British people don't do. We had so much fun, so much fun. After packing, Kim goes to see her close friend, Nicole Boulanger. Nicole is studying acting and singing. She's looking forward to returning to America to see her parents. I bought her a Christmas ornament that she had been looking for for her mom. She didn't realize that I bought it, so I surprised her with it. Gave her a big hug and, you know, said, I wish you Merry Christmas, love you, my friend, and big hug. And, and then, uh, you know, I had to get going because I had to get to Heathrow, um, get back to my flat and get my stuff. December the 21st is one of the busiest traveling days of the year. Staff are dealing with the pre-Christmas rush. Out on the tarmac, a Pan Am Jumbo 747 has just arrived from San Francisco. After refueling, it will make its next flight to New York this evening at 6 p.m., renamed Pan Am Flight 103. Before this happens, the brown suitcase will find its way into the cargo hold. In West London, Jazzwand Basuta is exhausted. He's been in the UK visiting relatives. He also speaks here for the first time. I had not seen my people for like four years from that time. So I went to see everybody here, dinner here, dinner here, party here, party there. 
Then finally, I decided to go back to the United States. Jaswan is returning home to his wife and children in New Jersey. He's anxious about getting to the airport and has arranged a lift with his brother-in-law. I was uh, looking for a very reliable person who could reach me airport in time because I have missed a flight before this flight once. So I told my brother-in-law, please pick me up at this time, sharp, so you take me to the Heathrow. At her home in Nantwich, Cheshire, Anne Mann is making last-minute Christmas preparations. Well, all our family were at home, of course. I was in the choir at church, so we had a carol service that night. In the past, Anne has spent Christmas with her younger brother, John. I think my dad thought he was a hippie in a way, because he used to say, I wish you'd get your hair cut. Because he got married with long hair. Well, longish hair, you know. John Stevenson is married to his childhood sweetheart, Geraldine. And they have two children, Hannah, 10, and Rachel, 8. You couldn't have had a nicer family. You couldn't. They were the most loving family. John loved the children. Geraldine was exactly the same. They both worked hard, because Geraldine was a teacher. But this year, John isn't spending Christmas with Anne. He and his family are on their way to Heathrow for a holiday. We were going to stay with Geraldine's sister in Boston for Christmas. They cashed in their air miles so the whole family could go. At Terminal 3, the check-in desks are now open. Flight 103 is due to depart for JFK in New York in three and a half hours' time. Pleased to have got a last-minute ticket is 22-year-old Flora Swire. An outstanding medical student, Flora has just been awarded a postgraduate place at Cambridge. She's decided to surprise her parents with the news when she gets back. Apart from being very clever, she was also loaded with common sense. She was terrific fun. I remember one or two of her friends came up for a bit of vacation there, and they were all dancing in synchrony in the middle of the floor. The whole city room floor was going up and down underneath their pounding feet, but uh, she really enjoyed life. Flora is going to spend Christmas with her boyfriend at Harvard. It's difficult to conduct a, a romance with one, one side of the Atlantic and one the other, so he'd come over in October, and two months later, it was her turn to go back to see him. I mean, she just chose randomly that, that uh, flight, Pan Am 103. Passengers for Pan Am Flight 103 have started to check in. Just how and when the brown suitcase arrives at Heathrow is disputed. But the airport security system fails to detect the bomb concealed inside. Passengers now passing through security include 19-year-old Ellie Ivel, who works at a dog's home in Windsor. The kennels had a Christmas party about three or four days before the 21st of December. And that's when this picture was taken. This is the only photograph I had, really, of her looking sort of more glamorous and more grown up. Christina is planning to meet Ellie in New York the following day. We were invited to go to my friends in New York. We didn't have any money, so we went as couriers. You take documents over and they pay most of your fare. But we couldn't travel together. Uh, the courier company refused. And we tossed the coin. Who's going to go first? I remember in the kitchen, we tossed the coin. And she won. A 
at John F. Kennedy Airport, Pan Am staff have begun to arrive for work. Linda Freyer is a former flight attendant, now working as a crew supervisor. There's something in airline people, and it's called wanderlust. It's kind of like fairy dust is spread out on all of us, and we love the travel, we love meeting people, we love experiencing new cultures, and so you're always looking for that next trip to, to go someplace and see something new. Pan Am Flight 103 from London is due to land at around 8 p.m. local time. It was a kind of a normal day. Um, you know, we're getting ready for holidays. We'd had a, a great holiday party the weekend before for everybody in the office. So it was, it was kind of an upbeat mood and people were happy and I, it, it was a nice day. Three hundred miles north of Heathrow, beneath the transatlantic flight path, is the small Scottish town of Lockerbie. Christmas time, I think, is quite quiet. We have our lights that are switched on. We have Christmas decorations up, and you have a little glass of wine or, a, or some little beverage of some sort, and uh, mince pies. Marion is at the Lockerbie ice rink. She's waiting for her nine-year-old son, David. He plays in the junior curling team. David would have walked across from school, which was just adjacent to the ice rink. And it's just something that is so accessible for children, you know, to walk across. And then I met him and uh, had his shoes and his money ready for him to play his game and to get his training that evening. Most of the 243 passengers for Pan Am Flight 103 have now checked in. The group of American students from Syracuse University are heading for Gate 14. Student Kim Wickham was also at Heathrow, but had changed her plans at the last moment. I had been speaking with my girlfriends in Germany, and their mother said to me at one point, Kimmy, Kimmy, you must come for Christmas. So I called my parents and my father and my mother, I don't think, were um, happy with me at all. They said, no, you're going to come home on the flight. And I really don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I'm at the Pan Am office and I took a deep breath and walked up to the lady and I changed my flight and uh, went to Germany. Jaswant Basuta has just arrived at the check-in, along with several family members who have turned up to say goodbye. I checked in my luggage. There were so many members of the family came to see me off. I went out, her brother, he said, listen, we still have time. You must have a beer with me. Me, my brother-in-law from Cardiff, our brother, so many people, we went to the bar. So I'm having a Carlsberg Special Brew. Filled it again, filled it again. As Jazz went down his third pint, passengers are beginning to board the plane. Ellie Ivel, who is traveling to New York as a courier, one day ahead of her mother, sits in aisle seat 19C. Flora Swire, who is visiting her boyfriend at Harvard, is towards the back of the plane in 39D. Seated in seat 28B is Kim Wickham's close friend, Nicole Boulanger. And the Stevenson family, John, Geraldine, and their two children, Rachel and Hannah, are in the middle, in seats 22D and 22G. Out on the tarmac, baggage handlers are loading the last pieces of luggage aboard Pan Am 103. By now, the brown suitcase has been placed in the hold. Whether by chance or design, it's at the bottom of the cargo container. Here, it will cause the greatest impact when it explodes. 
Air traffic controller Richard Dawson has two hours left on his shift. I was the air departure controller that evening for runway 27 right, um, which is the northerly runway of the two parallel runways that we have at Heathrow. There's one passenger who has not yet headed to the departure gate. Jaswant Basuta is still drinking with relatives in the airport bar. Suddenly, he sees the time. I said, I'm going to go. I hugged everybody. Bye. Went to my father-in-law, my brother, my sisters. I hugged them. I'm going. Jaswant has just minutes to reach gate 14. When I reach the gate, one guy said, if you are catching one of three, you're not going to make up. Just run. So I jumped out. I started running. Run, run, run when I reached the gate. Don't have to show the passport. Just go. I went. They locked the door. Jaswant misses the plane by a matter of seconds. But his suitcase is on board. The aircraft Clipper 103 first came into my eyesight over my left-hand shoulder. As they entered the runway, they opened the throttles on the four engines and accelerated down the runway and became airborne. And the words good night were exchanged between us. On board Pan Am 103 are 243 passengers and 16 crew. As Flight 103 begins its ascent, it is handed over to air traffic controller Robin Hill. The logic of the route is based on the weather circumstances, and on this particular day, the most advantageous winds were via Scotland. Pure chance to do with the, the meteorological situation at the time. The flight path will take the plane directly over Lockerbie, where David Murdoch has now finished on the ice. The captain has now switched off the fasten seatbelt sign. Ten minutes into the flight, the crew begin the in-flight service. The flight attendants would have gotten out of their seats at 10,000 feet. They would have gone to their respective work positions. The galley attendants would have been checking all the food preparation, counting, making sure they had sufficient proportions. The flight is now crossing the Scottish border, full of fuel for the transatlantic crossing. Marion Murdoch and her son, David, have set off for home from the Lockerbie ice rink. Their route will take them directly beneath Pan Am 103. They're now serving drinks in economy. You had your basic mixers, your vodka, your gin tonics. We had little bottles of champagne. You know, pina coladas were pretty popular. Just after 7 o'clock, air traffic control begins transmitting clearance for Pan Am 103 to head out over the Atlantic. Shelby clears the Clipper 103 to Kennedy, 59 north, 10 west, 62 north. They receive no reply. The bomb in the radio cassette player detonates, and Pan Am 103 breaks apart in the air. Six miles below, the explosion cannot be heard, but as the plane disintegrates, the four engines are still running. Marion and her son, David Murdoch, are now directly below the falling wreckage. This noise was getting louder and louder and louder. <laughs> and I was almost screaming at Mum to speed up the car. I really was panicking and trying to hold on to the steering wheel and wonder, what on earth is this happening? 
It was just so loud. So, that's... so loud. A really, really deep, deep loud noise. We heard the, you know, the, the impact, and it was almost like the car was like jumping off the road. Yeah. And I had actually turned round at this point and literally could see almost like the Hiroshima type bomb, the, the mushroom type cloud, and that was just pillowing up into the sky. Reports from other planes in the area immediately reach air traffic control. The pilots just reported a fireball. That's all they, they, they'd seen, a, a fireball in the Scottish borders area. It was a very clear night. It was a, a winter's night, very dark, so you can see a fireball from miles away. I think they thought immediately it was the petrol station had actually blown up, and that's where we've seen the, the big explosion. Two wings in the middle part of the fuselage containing 90 tonnes of aviation fuel have fallen 31,000 feet onto a residential street in the south of Lockerbie, narrowly missing the car of Marion Murdoch and her son, David. One of the first emergency workers to enter Sherwood Crescent, where the wings have landed, is off-duty police constable Robert Togneri. My first thoughts were that perhaps a tanker had crashed on the dual carriageway. I told my wife that I was going to see what had happened. There were major fires ongoing. There was debris all along the streets. I spoke to one resident, and there were a number of uh, parts of bodies lying about his garden and driveway. I had a hand put on my shoulder by another controller uh, to relieve me from my position, which was out of sequence. So I said to him, actually, it's not my turn, it's somebody else's turn to be relieved. And he said, yes, but we've gone into the distress phase for Pan American 103. It was just one of those feelings of, oh my God, you know, what, what on earth has happened here? What on earth has happened? At Terminal 3, police are searching for one passenger whose suitcase was on flight 103, although he was not. I'm just sitting there by myself, cursing myself. And the two cops came to me. Are you so and so? Yes. Where were you flying to? I said, to the United States, New York. He said that flight crashed in Scotland. I wouldn't believe him. Then they said, you have to go, come with us to the Heathrow police station and explain us how did you miss it. In New York, the flight's destination, Pan Am crew manager Linda Frere is on duty. I was talking to one of my colleagues, and um, the phone was ringing. And she sat down and uh, picked up the phone. And I could see her whole demeanor just change. And then she hung up the phone, and she looked at me, and she said, 103 is not on radar anymore. It fell off radar. So we went from a very uh, happy group that day to probably one of the worst days of our lives. An hour and 20 minutes after the bomb exploded, Jane Swire, mother of medical student Flora, is at home. All I remember was that a flash came sort of onto the television that evening. A Pan American 747 jumbo jet with 258 people on board has crashed 15 miles north of the Scottish border. Like all parents, you sort of have a, a terrible sixth sense that, that this, was, this was it, that this could have been her flight. There are no details of casualties yet. We'll bring you more details on News at 10. Ellie Ivel's mother, Christina, is also watching TV. It was on the news, and I knew straight away it was, it was that plane. I don't know why, I just knew. Police discover the cockpit of the Jumbo in a field three miles east of Lockerbie. The question now is, 
Are there any lives to save? Specialist rescue workers are arriving to help search for survivors. Among them, RAF mountain rescue leader David Wally. It was a scene from hell when I got there. Remember, this happened in a rural area with the smallest police force in the UK, smallest fire service, smallest ambulance service. David puts on a head torch to do a reconnaissance of the town and surrounding fields. There was bodies everywhere. This was a battlefield. This was not what we were used to. Remember, I had nearly 20 years' experience of aircraft crashes. I had never seen this amount of young people and children and Christmas presents. And there was Christmas presents everywhere. So it was surreal, the whole thing was. Now in Germany, Kim Wickham has just had dinner with her friends. She decided at the last minute not to travel home to America with the rest of the group from Syracuse University, including her close friend, Nicole. I heard the phone ring and I was like, geez, that's weird. And so I walked over to it and I picked it up. It was my grandmother. And uh, she's like, Kim, Kim, is that you, Kim? And uh, she's all like, you know, sounding a little off. And I'm like, yeah, Grandma, you're, what are you calling? It's the middle of the night. So she proceeded to tell me that my plane crashed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> can it, you just, yeah, just give me one second. <laughs> so. <laughs> so my grandmother, um, you know, told me what happened. And um, so I woke up my girlfriend, Claudia, and she quickly woke her parents up and we turned the TV on and flames <laughs> everywhere. You know, we saw flames everywhere. I thought, oh my God, Nicole. Nicole's mother is on her way to collect her from the airport. We were so excited. I had done baking, I had decorated the house and did all the cleaning. And I was just gonna be looking forward to hearing from her all of the wonderful things that she experienced that semester. As relatives arrive, Pan Am crew manager Linda Freya is at the terminal building. By the time I got up there, a lot of the family members from the Syracuse University students had started to assemble. And they were being taken aside because they were taken up to the Clipper Club to be uh, kept away from the photos and the pictures and everything that was going on. And they were being told uh, of the accident. that I'll never forget because she collapsed pretty much in front of me, in front of the podium, upon seeing um, information about the flight. It just never leaves you. It's just there. And, um, and you just didn't know what to do or what to say. The hard part of recalling that was that I couldn't move. I had tripods between my legs. I had visual people in my face with flashes and lights. And um, it felt like forever. I'm sure it was only a short time. And people helped me up. And that was the beginning of our nightmare. Two and a half hours after the crash, 40 ambulances have arrived in Lockerbie. 18-year-old police constable Colin Dorrance was on the scene. You could see ambulances, nose to tail, parked and unattended, or not being used. 
and that told the, the story that this was an all or nothing thing. You were either dead and gone, or you were physically unscathed by it. It, it seemed to be very much all or nothing. It's obviously still too early to put a precise figure on the number of dead and injured, but indications so far suggest that there were no survivors from the aircraft. The number of ground casualties is still being assessed. In Cheshire, Anne Mann doesn't know if her brother and his family were on the flight. I spoke to Heathrow and they said they would ring us back. They wouldn't, obviously, it didn't have all the passenger lists, they didn't know it, etc. then, but they would ring us back and they rang us in the early hours of the morning, two or three in the morning, to say yes, they were on. At Heathrow, police are interrogating their first suspect. Jaswant Basuta missed the flight by just one minute and has been detained by police for questioning. So they took me to the Heathrow police station, which was a very, very uh, long, long, long interrogation. And uh, couldn't, they couldn't find anything. They say, tonight you have to stay here. I say, I'm not going to stay here tonight. Why should I stay? What did I do wrong? Jaswant's wife in New Jersey has no idea that he didn't get on the plane. At first light, press helicopters circling the town reveal the devastation at Sherwood Crescent made by the impact of the wing section of the plane. Three houses have been totally vaporized. Twelve Lockerbie residents are currently missing. Dawn also reveals a second crash site to the west of Sherwood Crescent. A large section of the fuselage had fallen in Park Place. Flight 103 had been traveling at 500 miles an hour and at 31,000 feet. With the strong winds, debris was dispersed from Lockerbie almost 100 miles to the North Sea. The primary difficulty for the police was just the sheer scale of the crash site. This was the, the biggest loss of life that there had been since the Second World War. They were faced with what was a, a huge and very, very difficult job. David Wally is leading a mountain rescue team from Fife, drafted in to help recover bodies and look for the black box. Now, because the guys in the teams are, in the RAF teams, are, a lot of them are engineers, we know where the black box should be. And they found that at first light. At half past six, I think, they found it. And they brought it straight in, and that went away to get checked. While they wait to hear if the black box holds any clues, each one of the bodies from the plane has to be photographed and its location recorded before it can be moved. In the first few hours, we located 160 bodies. That is incredible. Our guys were putting jackets and things over the people. A, to give them dignity, and B, because they'd seen once and once is enough. In Bromsgrove, Jane and Jim Swire are waiting to hear if their daughter Flora's body has been found. It was a, an absolute nightmare. You have to somehow try and carry on. We had to try and manage to <laughs> scrape together some meals and, and, and just try and um, hold on together as a family. Within hours of recovering the plane's black box, police have already studied its recordings. The black box showed that there was no evidence of mechanical or structural failure. And that, of course, was further evidence that it was a terrorist attack and not a catastrophic failure of the aircraft. Unbeknownst to investigators, Somewhere amongst the 290 tons of wreckage are fragments of the radio cassette player. At Heathrow Police Station, Jaswant Basuta is released after initial questioning. One of the officers calls his wife, but she refuses to believe he is alive. She said, I know everything what you're telling to tell me. 
he was in the flight, he crashed. I have called my father, he said, yes, he was in the flight. So he's dead. She wouldn't believe still, because her father has confirmed he's, he was in the plane. So everybody confirmed my death. Covering the town of Lockerbie and the surrounding countryside, search teams create a map detailing where each passenger fell. John Stevenson and his two daughters, Rachel and Hannah, are discovered in a field three miles from the town. John was found by the wall at Tundagar, um, and the girls were behind that further up the hill in two separate places. Three days after the crash, police make a vital discovery. Two police dog handlers found a piece of blackened and twisted aluminium, which appeared to show signs of explosive damage. It has been established that two parts of the metal luggage pallet framework show conclusive evidence of a detonating high explosive. The explosives residues recovered from the debris have been positively identified and are consistent with the use of a high performance fast explosive. You didn't think that someone wanted to blow a plane out of the sky. It just seemed like um, something so horrible that it wasn't conceivable in someone's mind to blow themselves up conceivably and or a plane full of innocent people. In Lockerbie, the process of releasing the bodies to families has begun. Flora Swire's body was found on the town's golf course, along with 43 others. I didn't want to see her body, partly because I knew it would be damaged by that huge fall of 30 or 1,000 feet. And I had a horrible feeling I might remember her in that state instead of that lovely, vibrant, beautiful girl whom I'd kissed goodbye to at the weekend before. So I didn't want to see her body, but it was important to Jim. Her face was unrecognizable. And I said to her, well, would you mind if I looked at her feet? They uncovered her feet for me. She'd consulted me once about a mole she had on her big toe. And there, on her big toe was the mole. So although her face was almost unrecognizable and her eyes were open, her big toe clinched it. Ellie Ivel's body was found in a field on the edge of Lockerbie and is finally released to her mother four weeks later. Well, she had just a tiny bruised hair and her mouth was sort of droopy on one side, looked a bit sulky. Otherwise, her face was fine, but covered up to her neck. Six weeks after the crash, the search for victims is finally called off. 259 passengers and crew and 11 local residents are confirmed dead. The bodies of 17 of those are never recovered. So a special memorial service is held for them in Lockerbie. Let us commend to the love and care of our father, all our brothers and sisters who were suddenly taken from us in this disaster. One of the bodies never found was that of American student Nicole Boulanger. Nicole had been seated in the wing section of the plane that exploded on impact at Sherwood Crescent. We still kept hoping that um, her body would be recovered, but as time went on, we had to accept the fact that that was not going to occur. I had requested, however, of the Pan Am officials dirt from Sherwood Crescent Crater, where it was found that my daughter had died. And of course, I knew it wouldn't contain any body parts, but I have it at home in a box, and it is to be buried with me when it is my time.
I was supposed to be on the plane. I feel guilty. You, you just do, I think. I, I don't really know what the logic of it is. I don't know that there is a logic to it, but it doesn't really go away. Christina and her daughter Ellie had tossed a coin to decide who would travel on Pan Am 103. It would have been better if it had been the other way around. The guilt, the guilt that you sort of imagine yourself rushing over to Heathrow, dragging her out of the queue, don't go. But it's just a life sentence. In America, every year Syracuse University holds an annual memorial service to one of the 35 students who died in the tragedy. Thirty years on, it's the first time Kim Wickham has felt able to attend the annual event in memory of her friends. I still remember everything like it happened yesterday. I still remember going to see Nicole. I still remember my grandmother calling me and telling me what happened. John Stevenson's sister, Anne, still has a tape recording of her younger brother and his family. Are you going to say something to yeah. Daddy? Go on. Say hello. Hello. Say, this is Hannah speaking. This is Hannah speaking. And how old is Hannah? Four. And how old is Rachel? Five. No, you're not five, darling. How old are you? Two. Two. Say, I am Rachel and I am two. I am brother Rachel. Oh, blah, 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 blah. At least they were all together. That's the one the consolation. They were together. They were a family holding hands in a circle. No widow, widower, orphans. Just one complete family. Thirty years ago, Jim and Jane Swire began work on a memorial to their beloved daughter, Flora, that has stood the test of time. I was unable to do almost anything to begin with for the first few weeks, and as it happened by chance, a delivery of trees had been made because we had a plan to start a wood near our house, and it struck me immediately that I wanted a vibrant living memorial in memory of such a vibrant girl. I have good memories of her humor and her companionship and her, her joy, really, the joy she brought us. But it's not, not the same as having her with us every day. And these trees are new life of a sort, but it's nothing compared with the, the, the life and love of, of a, a wonderful daughter.